Mm. Excellent. Um, yeah, so how are you? Uh, I'm doing okay. I've been super busy, so sorry I haven't gotten everything back to you that I promised. Yeah, um, Yeah. same here. Um, yeah. Trying to corral people, um, yeah, responding to various interviews. Some of the mm-hmm. design is going forward. Like, I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, like we've got a really cool design of the axial flux motor in the works that's being prototyped. Cool. Um, just take a take a look at this. The kind of it relates to um, what you might like about information architecture. Mm-hmm. But take a look at um, so Michelle is one of the guys, and in the chat box, scroll down and look at that look at that motor in WebGL. You can explode it. So that's what we're working where, with. Sorry, where am I looking at? Is there a link to this? Yeah, I put it in the chat box, but you can also look at my screen. Oh, I see. Okay. Sorry. The there chat. it is. Um, you can explode oh, that so cool. with a slider. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's the kind of stuff we're working on in WebGL. Um, oh, amazing. Love and that's it. like, this is fully 3D printable. It looks like it will work and it'll be really high efficiency. So, um, in progress. Amazing. Yeah, cool stuff. Um, But yeah, so talking to people, doing people, I'm working on a budget still. Like I'm uh, in a document as far as the tasks Mm -hmm. document. Um, There's a few more names. Um, I got a few more names lined up. It is kind of going slow, but it's uh, so I'm, I think, uh, combining that with probably some paid work that might do it. I mean, we're kind of inching along. Like as you mm-hmm. see, um, I put it in the chat box. Yeah. Um, and I was trying to clarify that document a bit, um, like you know, simple visuals like slide six, seven, you know, day one summary, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Date and then going on like day two and three and four. Uh, but mm-hmm. just trying to really get that clear and get all the components up there. It's kind of a working document. And then, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, this is great. I'm looking through it now. Um, this, is, this is much better. There's a much, much better sense of like what actually is happening. Um, I think and there's enough going, going on. Yeah. There's enough going on in each day that uh, it will probably be worth really breaking out each day into kind of a full standalone thing. Right. Uh, just at least, at least for now in terms of um, the roadmap for the event. It's like I'm looking here at the like bigger picture community roadmap. Um, mm-hmm. All of a sudden, like slide 17 and on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I see it. Um, is, I mean, it's cool, but it feels like that's it's unrelated control. to it, it's, it's for a different audience. audience. That, that I feel like, like that's what you put on the you know the slideshow for investors, um, or for people where you're, or maybe you put it at the beginning as something that you don't expect people to read very closely. But you're like, this is how I want you to understand how this fits into the bigger picture. Yeah. Um. So here's a question. Yep. Um. Do you? Um, where, what's your funding situation for this right now? Nothing. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. the, what I'm doing right now is, um, so this breakdown, like if you look at page five, that's like mm-hmm. the tasks. But really for every task we have, like starting with the purple bubbles, like I really want to mm-hmm. get clear about what each involves and how much work there is. So I was going to break it down into a budget. And then pass it on to my uh, collaborator on this. And he said, hey, we can, uh, if we got to accelerate this, let's just get some money for it. Like pretty Mm -hmm. much as like a zero interest loan that would come out of proceeds of future events. So Mm -hmm. I was looking at that. Um, I mean, right now it looks like page two, it's going, there's names being added. Mm -hmm. But... You know the way we're going right now. You know, it's not going to happen in three months. I think we really want to accelerate it, and put some more effort behind it. So I think it's it makes a lot of sense to generate some revenue to make this happen. 
or to get a loan or something because um yeah i mean we're not we don't have any funding we're, we're bootstrapped so we run events and yeah. we pay the bills and stuff like that no, so i understand but yeah that's how it was a long time um mm -hmm. here i'm sending something in chat uh that's if you're not familiar with that it's a foundation that's uh you know built on open sources you know <laughs> no i know that I've, I've been i've been a fellow Oh, that's great. You were. For two okay. years, yes. Yeah, um, okay. As an alumni page. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. Okay. Um, okay, never mind then. I was going to talk to them about, actually, like, once we do the incentive challenge on the cordless drill, I, mm -hmm. I would say they should see that, see if they want to put in some money into that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. For now, it's like, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, if if my mentor he's offering that, basically getting um, passing that to some of his friends and seeing if we could do that, that's number one option. So that could be could be read ready funding. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, like um, in the next few months, next couple of months, I'm I'm doing some production runs of printers. So, so we make printers, and I'm gonna do a couple of production runs, and that's I'm aiming for like 10k, starting at about 10k per month revenue from mm -hmm. that. Um, now mm -hmm. that's to be, all to be developed, so maybe it won't start up all at once. But producing kits is what we do too. So we've got a good 3D right. printer, so we're getting that out into kit, kit and production. Yeah. Okay. Great. <clears throat> did you ever consider applying for Shuttleworth Foundation? I did. I did apply. I. I got rejected like the week after I found out my co-founder died, and I'm hmm. pretty bummed about the whole thing. Oh yeah, no, that's. Um, and uh, the applications are opening up again. I'm trying to decide if I have enough give a fuck to try again. Mm -hmm. Um, but in any case. Yeah, so probably the next step here. Yes, so uh, what I want, want to continue on doing here is to keep breaking down this thing into tasks. You mentioned <coughs> when you say break it into a standalone project, you mean like, are you also suggesting like, oh, well, I'll run one day camps too, or like make it into a one day event? Well, or? Um, more what I mean is that, uh, so, you know, right now you have this. Very, you know, very dense. Uh, this very information dense layout, mm -hmm. and uh, but the the thing is that you have you know it, it's all modular, and so rather than saying like okay this is you know a nine day chunk that has to kind of come in in this format, what you really have is you know nine one day chunks that can be rearranged and reordered. Uh, and you know, taught as a single weekend course. If you take these two days out of it, taught as you know, this four day review. If you pull out half the content from each day or something like that, but like, yeah. uh, I think you're already on the right track as far as making it modular. I think it just needs to be understood that way. Because um, if you can say, okay, this is uh, instead of saying this is you know, day one, say like, okay, this is. Um, you know, universal access and controller is, you know, one module. And, you know, modules, you know, A, B, and C depend on this being complete, but can be done in any order. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's probably something to add to, into this whole documentation, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's, I think... Um, yeah, I'll do that. I was planning on doing something more, more or less like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I think the you know there's a ton here, and it's really valuable, uh, really amazing information. But being able to, I think part of what's going to turn people off is this sense that like, you know, okay, this this is what you're doing on these days in this order, um, where for a lot of people this could be, you know, like what you're what you're doing on you know a one could be like a month long project for some people. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than saying like okay this is day one and then you move right to the next thing, say so like this is this is step one that happens across whatever timeline you need it to, and this is the things that you do, and then with once step one is done, that opens up 
steps, you know, A, B, and C, which then opens up the whole ecosystem. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, so rather than, yeah, I mean, you've got, you've got all this stuff here, which is fantastic, but it's like, the, yeah, yeah. the flowchart, the flowchart gets pretty intense. Yeah, yeah, by all means. I mean, the, I mean, these are just working notes here, like, this is, you know, oh, this is, yeah. yeah, like you said, it's like, this is like a year or something of work stuff but that's that's also the beauty it's also the challenge because yeah it's so much mm -hmm. bandwidth people have so communicating this is step one and right now just just to the point i'm just trying to get to the budget here just throwing down all this stuff and trying to break it down mm -hmm. um like slide five here has granular this is our development template like 20 steps mm -hmm. for any piece of hardware that's what we use um and yeah and um so just kind of trying to be accountable for hours that are going to be required now mm -hmm. I, I looked at air tables i'm not sure i, I can do it uh because uh, we're already doing like all this spreadsheet stuff and mm -hmm. uh, we kind of do it more like more even more simple tools i'm reluctant to actually dive into oh. another tool with a slight learning curve because we're trying to say oh. let's use the absolute yeah. minimum mm -hmm. of tools so it's like sure. wikis, oh. docs and so forth um, now the other thing that occurred to me, like maybe, like I was thinking, like okay, so you're doing all this stuff related to info architecture, mm -hmm. uh, like process architecture. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, um, definitely want to talk to you more about this, like for the incentive challenge and just in general as far as how we document this, and you know if we can get you on board, or if you know even in this. Uh, initial stage of funding right now that I'm gonna write this up for to get funded and I, I should know like you know like I'll just leave myself this week like are we gonna get this money or not and then s see what we need to take as the next step like probably have an answer by the end of this week I was hoping to uh, finish up the budget today and then um, maybe we can hire you but I don't know we'll we'll see mm -hmm. about that but for the future I think the it, what you're doing with MakerNet uh, like the support infrastructure for micro factories or distributed manufacturing, right? That's big stuff. That's the next trillion dollar economy. So, and part of it is the the information architecture behind it. So platforms behind mm -hmm. that. So yeah, yeah, definitely, um, definitely a lot of common ground there. Because uh, I don't know how much you've seen uh, about our work, but I mean, also back in 2012, we did this thing called the Open Source Hardware Documentation Jam in New York City where we mm -hmm. try to get around, okay, what does document like proper documentation look like and so forth. But nobody's kind of really solved it and people are using different standards. But yeah, I think it would be yeah, important to, to have some basic understanding. And I'm kind of looking at it as my mission now to kind of collect all the people around the micro factory. Like, okay, people, let's do this. I mean, Fab is, was written uh, 13 years ago by Gershenfeld. Uh, mm -hmm. In practice, nothing really has happened in terms of distributed manufacturing. Like, I mean, it hasn't. I mean, no, that's a critical view, but uh, I think the potential is like right now things could be happening, and and I certainly see that gap there, even with very simple stuff like okay, um, setting up 3D print shops with which can do real distributed businesses, but of course there's some missing links. Mm -hmm. um, and let's let's be deliberate about answering those missing links and seeing how we can improve them so yeah i do want to like part of this so the steam camps towards the incentive challenge towards i didn't mention too much about summers of extreme design build or like extreme build events which we'd want to co mm -hmm. coordinate as well mm -hmm. so that we gather the people that are participating into into extreme builds uh large-scale prototyping events that's how we work on build outs with our stuff like we build the house like in five days and stuff like that but we want to use that as a regular pattern that uh, a lot of people can get around that so awesome. uh, there's these three aspects one you train the people through steam camps two you you have real viable incentive challenges that produce real product and then mm -hmm. real prototyping and i'm thinking like uh, around the steam camp too and i didn't emphasize it, but it's really like three days of design three days of build and three days of enterprise and i didn't really uh, talk about that too much yet but i want to put in i was thinking initially like one day of enterprise at the end but maybe like even two mm -hmm. or three 
like where we're saying, okay, we're creating a business and all the business ass assets for, for an enterprise. Mm -hmm. A sales site even. Um, there's product, there's marketing, there's all these elements that I think we can teach about that. So, so also position this as, okay, we can be developing real enterprises based around the small micro factory concept where you can just start cranking out, okay, a 3D printed pen, a cordless drill, a Raspberry Pi tablet, vacuum robots, um, things like that. I mean, that, that can be done like today, so it's like crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're trying to really like get focused around that. Um, it's definite, definite huge opportunity there. And I do, do recognize some of the gaps. Like, I want to show you this one thing about, um, like, why isn't it happening? So I think a lot about, wait, like, why is this not happening? Well, yeah, um, I do too. Right. So let, let, maybe you can uh, help me out on this here. Or you can, I can share this with you. Distributed manufacturing page. And there's, uh, so why has industrial product have not been achieved? in the maker movement so take a look at this thing that i th these are my notes so chat box there there yeah uh take a look at that um you know the common culprits there by the way i um I, uh i sent out a note to the um the open know-how group mm -hmm. that was andrew lamb um Andrew Lamb is on that? Uh, I basically sent out a note to the, the group uh, sort of nominating you to be invited to the next cool. uh, big group call. So yeah, if you see a, an email about that, would, um, definitely hop on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, of course. Let's see. All right, let me read through this. Um, I see you list the green tab lab in here. Have you been talking to Marco? Um, couldn't really find his contact. I, I think I emailed him I, through the con. Uh, yeah, I didn't. He didn't right. respond. Okay, I can, I can put you in touch. If, yeah, can you uh, do that? Because um, I, I think I had a hard time finding out. I don't think I found his email. I, honestly, I mostly interact with him over Facebook Messenger. That seems to be the best way to reach him. Uh, I'll send him a note and see if there's a, a personal email that he's got that would be useful for you. of Buenos Aires, I guess. Hmm? He's at the what University of Buenos Aires? Uh, I don't know. I think so. Or he may have been. Um. It's Marco or Marcos? Yeah, no, that's him. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's him. Oh, it's like you're already connected. Oh. There you go. 
Oh, when was this? Uh, that was in 2015. <laughs> Sixteen. Okay, okay, so... Um, do you have any, uh, any thoughts on the limits of distributed manufacturing? Like, what, what are your all... Did you write any, um, anything on that? Yeah, so... Uh, did you ever read... Uh, Anna Waldman Brown's research paper on this. No, no. Let me see if I can, I can dig that out because I think she she lays that out pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, this was part of her uh, like master's thesis at um, at MIT. Mm -hmm. And she's the one with the Atlas of Innovation. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, here we go. box. Um, highly recommend this because it was a, a pretty deep exploration yeah. of a lot of this idea. Um, I, I imagine that, you know, let's see, I mean, I mean, so so that aside, uh, in terms of my own my own thoughts on it, I think the main the main thing is that under you know under under current capitalist sort of situations, uh, this kind of fully open source distributed manufacturing is always going to be this sort of bizarre edge case that most people don't know what to do with, uh, and that many people who do understand it will be threatened by it and will have a lot more money than us to, to act on that feeling of being threatened. Mm -hmm. uh, so the places, the places where this is going to really show, show, it, show its potential and possibly take hold are going to be places that are sort of well outside the... Um, the standard, you know, capitalist ecosystem, um, which is, you know, more and more places as everything kind of starts to break down. Um, mm -hmm. But in in my mind, this like the the people who really need this kind of ecosystem uh, are the people who are, you know, at the edges or outside of the um, kind of like the dominant paradigm uh, and they're they're gonna be the ones who prove the the model and then once it's sort of been sufficiently proven and it starts to like leak back into the mainstream that's when you're gonna start seeing broader adoption but it's gonna be be the people you know like for example um, you know, open source farm equipment. Uh, I'm if you if you had like demonstrable working models that you could actually like take to a field and say like, look here, this I built this tractor from you know nothing like you, and it's here's the here's the plans, here's how you do it. Um, now you don't have to spend twice as much on a you know John Deere tractor that you're not allowed to repair or modify. Um, mm -hmm. Going to the people who are you know, small American farmers that are going bankrupt because they can't afford their farm equipment because it's a fucking rigged game. They're going to be the ones who are interested in that, but they're also going to be the ones who are going to have to figure out how to do it with no money because they're going bankrupt. Like, it's a, 
it's a really tricky scenario. Um, planning people outside of the American ecosystem entirely uh, is probably going to be easier in some ways, but the, then you're going to have challenges with localization and needing to find sort of a regional contact who can really drive that. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's it's debatable which way is going to happen. Um, yeah, of course. I think you're saying the you're basically saying the violence scenario. I kind of look at I I'm more inclined to say there's entrepreneurs and that's who changes the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so just like you know, say whatever, like Facebook, Amazon. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be that way, man. Uh, there's not going to be any. I don't think there's going to be any bloodshed over this. This is just business, business mm -hmm. norms. It's going to get co-opted just like open software has done. It's going to the same thing's mm -hmm. going to happen. All of a sudden, we're going to have a cascade of open source. Uh, it's going mm -hmm. to get co-opted just like open source software. And unless mm -hmm. there's uh, deli very deliberate thought about the distributive aspects of it, then yeah. um, it'll be just business as usual for for longer. But there are. But right. I think there are some. My opinion on that, though, is that there are some very unique features of hardware that make it a little different than software because it's just more tangible. The liberatory yeah, okay. potential, I'd say the liberatory potential of hardware, like once that gets out there, like, you know, you got local micro factories, they're producing engines and stuff like that. They're producing mm -hmm. tractors in a few years. Um, I, I think that the timeline for that is about... Uh, I'd say about five years for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like with us, I mean, with us, I mean, our our tractors, for example, I mean, they're ready for prime time. It's been so many prototypes. Um, mm -hmm. I think the next step to be very deliberate about, okay, here's the economic models how by which we spread them. So that's where we're at right now. Um, mm -hmm. It works and it works better than expected. And it's easier than I ever thought. So awesome. with, with digital fabrication, all of that. So, <laughs> I mean, it's just beautiful. Um, yeah. So right no, now it. it's it's just getting ready for prime time, um, mm -hmm. and that's part of this uh, this Steam Camp thing. Like the Steam Camp is that's one aspect. Um, second aspect is the incentive challenges. Mm -hmm. the, the incentive challenge result is going to be very interesting. Like okay, we'll see. It's a very deliberate experiment. Okay, a small thing like the cordless drill. Like okay, does this thing really work? Mm -hmm. Can we get people to collaborate? Um, I mean, we'll see that because nobody's done that social experiment yet. Like. I, which I was really surprised. No, nobody's done that experiment yet. Can you get people mm -hmm. to collaborate like, on an incentive? None of the other incentive challenges, and I think I said that last time, none of the other incentive challenges are collaborative. They're all competitive. So why is nobody asking even if collaborative is feasible? I, I'm not sh I don't understand that enough. Uh, but I think it's just our wiring, the 200 years of um, proprietary history, perhaps. Yeah, not a great. Mindsets. There's, so there's a... There's a really brilliant approach to some stuff like this. Um, a friend of mine did this while she was teaching, and you know, it's like the the standard model in Western education is you you know it's competitive. You assume everyone is uh, competing to individually solve a problem that can be solved by any individual. Mm -hmm. So the minute you have two people working together, that's cheating. Um, what she did was she said, okay, I'm going to raise the difficulty here. Mm -hmm. So the the now the question is something that would be, you know, theoretically maybe almost possible for one person to do, but ideally you should all be working on this together or at least in large groups because there's no way one person can do it. Yeah. So nothing is, nothing is cheating. And suddenly everyone is coordinating action and all working together and you get much better outcomes uh, in terms of what people actually learn. Um, ha are you familiar with... That's awesome. Uh, like, who is this? Um... There's, there's actually been some really good, I think, TED Talks even about it. Uh, my friend Dylan was running uh, some of the law school classes she was teaching uh, along this model. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, let's see. Well, what you just said is exactly what we're doing for the incentive challenge. The thing is too mm -hmm. complicated. It's going to involve 3D printers, I think, as far as I know, with heated build chambers, which don't exist today. And we're going to op we're going to open source that. Uh, if you read in, okay. uh, yeah, what I read in that thing, uh, there's right now 3D printing is limited because we don't have enclosed chamber 3D printers like yeah, high temperature, um, mm -hmm. which I don't know if you've been following, but the patent on that runs out this year. Okay. 
Yeah, that's one thing. But the other thing is we've got another method that does not infringe the patent. Patent that uh, I'm hoping that we'll be uh, selling that in a few months. Yeah, it's pretty simple awesome. stuff. But yeah, that's super cool. Um, yeah, no. What I was gonna say is it might be worth looking at. Um, let's see. Is it is it this one? Uh, I was going to say, it might be worth looking at um, Hackaday uh, and, like, talking to them directly. Uh, there's... Uh, regarding? Uh, approach from how? Oh, so, um, you know, because they... What you're talking about doing in terms of, like, a cooperative design challenge yeah. is not an yeah. exact fit with what they do. Um, however, it's it's interesting enough and it's, uh, I think it, I think it would be it would be an interesting enough edge case that it'd be worth actually just reaching out to them directly and starting a conversation about seeing if they're willing to kind of change their the the you know their framework and model a little bit to run this experiment with you because uh, you've got pretty much everything that is needed to start that like you just need them to they, they would be a really great host and they'd have a ton of traffic already. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems like a, it seems like a natural partnership if you can make it work. Uh, who's the person there? I should be talking to. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't know if I have a good contact there. Let me check. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, Adam Adam Benzion is the one person I know. Um, uh, we spoke ages ago, but it's been a long time. And that's in San Francisco. They are, right? Uh, I think there's kind of spread out across the West Coast. I think they have San Francisco, but I think Seattle's actually their main base, mm -hmm. I recall. Mm -hmm. At least it was. Oh wait, that's Hackster, not Hackaday. Oh, okay. Um, uh, let's see. Here we go. Uh, no, I do have a contact at Hackaday. That's the, that's the other one. Um, yeah, talk to that guy. What's his name? Uh, here. I got the email. Yeah. Uh, here you go. Okay. Excellent. What's he do there? Uh, like events or special events? Um, or... So, let's see. Uh, the only reason I know him, we're not, you know, super close. But the reason I know who he is is because um, a while ago he was working on uh, putting together a contest for something called World Create Day. Oh. Okay. Um, that was basically yeah. like. Sourcing real-world problems with the humanitarian focus that makers around the world can take a crack at solving. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it seemed value aligned with what the kind of, with the kind of stuff that you're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you know, this was this was maybe a year ago. So I don't I don't know for sure that he's still there, but it seems likely. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. How are you doing on, on getting jobbed? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the eternal struggle. Um, well, uh, 
I've been working doing some like prototyping engineering at a robotics startup in SF. Um, that's been fun, though. Um, you know, it's still like early stage startup, so it's always kind of a crapshoot about whether or not it'll you know continue to exist next month or it could be a completely different thing. You're doing that right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a few days a week, but. Um, What's, you to, what's your specific skill set? So you know, mechatronics, robotics, automation, like coding. Is that? Correct? Um, what's, I'm I'm very much a generalist. Like I can do, you know, some microcontroller stuff and some coding stuff. I'm doing a lot of like CAD and 3D printing, um, process design. Uh, there's a lot of operationalizing. Something that's just been, you know, kind of thrown together ad hoc and me coming in and saying like this is how you build a, a process and this is how you you know keep track of the settings mm-hmm. that you're using so you know which ones work instead of having to like stare at a blank screen every time um are you good at operations like actually managing operations project management yeah right? I, honestly i'd say that i'm probably better at that than the robotics part but i'm mm-hmm. i'm good enough at the robotics part that i can be useful there and um you know a lot of what i'm working on right now is like you know, designing in CAD and then 3D printing a bunch of jigs so that the, you know, prototype assembly process is actually, you know, faster and more accurate. Um, but we're, the, the plan right now is that uh, if he closes this round of funding, we're going to move into a new space and then I'm going to basically come in and help him set up the workshop so that we actually have workflow and we're not just like sitting around his, his living room table. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do a bit of everything. I mean, I can, you know, weld and carpent and, you know, do stuff with laser cutters and whatnot. I'm I'm a, I'm a maker of all, you know, I'm a general maker, yeah. um, but I'm definitely not a, a master in any one area. Yeah, I was going to ask. So next year, also another topic. Next year, mm-hmm. summer of extreme design build. Three months of intense build outs here to build the mm-hmm. facility. Um, would you be available? Can I hire you for like uh, some time there? There's one is during the camp, so so once again, similar to this, we'll be running um, extreme builds of various sorts, from the tractors to mm-hmm. to torch tables, aquaponic greenhouses, and and shit. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, <laughs> and um, all things. Yeah. So two. Uh, I'm looking for people two to like minimum of two weeks as an instructor. So mm-hmm. this is instructor, paid and all that. Uh, would you be available for two yeah. plus weeks? If if this gig works okay. out for you, um, your would your time be limited or can you still do it? Uh, so one of the things that I, I really like about this place is that they they seem to be pretty good at having flexible time. Like one of the friends that I'm working there with just took off, you know, two weeks to go climb a mountain. And everyone's mm-hmm. like, great, have fun. So you need to get back. Mm-hmm. So I, ex- I expect that as long as there's some advance notice, I should be able to mm-hmm. be flexible with my time like that. Would you Would you be able to do a month? I mean, it'll be basically like nine to five every day, like that's that we're active in the days. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds like if I'm going to come out and teach this, I'd need to come out early and like make sure that I actually have have all that in muscle memory before I start trying to teach it to anyone else. So being out, you know, for at least twice the length of the workshop seems like it would be the thing that would need to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm definitely interested. Yeah. Um, okay. you know, uh, definitely, definitely keep me on the list. Um, and okay. we'll have to, you know, we'll, we'll talk about what, you know, is yeah. what you have available in terms of budget and when the time actually happens. But, but for now, I assume I'm definitely interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just want to put it on your radar because it's going to be like pretty much like, you know, OSC 2.0, like somewhat mm-hmm. next year. Um, but the idea is we did a, tw- in 2014, we did a thing. We had about uh, 18, 24 people throughout the summer. But this time around, mm-hmm. it's going to be bigger and more organized. I mean, that time it was so wild. But right now, uh, I'm looking at <laughs> so three instructors plus a community manager that we would have because mm-hmm. it's going to be crazy stuff happening. Uh, so yeah, hire staff and do this right. But yeah, so I'm looking for people and and it'll be three instructors at a time and it's three months altogether, like June, July, August. So okay, 
it's going to be a lot, of time, I need a lot of diff a lot of people diverse skills mm -hmm. and the attraction will be also you know the people we can bring in if they bring in extra skills that's better for us to for yeah, advertising totally. and all that mm -hmm. yep okay that's, that's the point awesome cool yeah i'm, I'm definitely interested i think it'd be, it'd be pretty amazing um keep that in mind Yeah, so so maybe it's kind of how you know. Given that, then uh, I'm going to be looking at the Steam Camp uh, documentation that you've got here, mm -hmm. kind of with an eye of like how would how would I teach this in a you know two week intensive. Uh, is your is your plan still to get through this entire? Uh, you know, circuit plotter, drone, Arduino, 3D printer, CNC mill, cordless welder, as as the content of the entire thing. The four days, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. basically, if you've got the universal axis, you make your simple uh, CNC machine using the mm -hmm. universal controller, and then you're just adding three different heads. So that's mm -hmm. the way it's manageable. Mm -hmm. And if each is a kit, you know, if it's well developed. I mean, we've got the universal axis. I mean, that's down pretty good. Mm -hmm. We've got experience with all of this, but not, not we d haven't developed yet the interchangeable head, for example. So that's that's the design mm -hmm. challenge there to make it easily interchangeable, so you can practically work on a three different functions. So that's that's a little mm -hmm. bit of design there. Um, but yeah, yeah, and like for example, the three D printed electric motor, like. You know, we started with this kit that was pretty much wood and other stuff. Now we're 3D printing and like super simple, just getting it down to really refined production engineering, i.e., I fast 3D printed parts and standard hardware kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So yes, the uh, the answer is yes because it's doable and we need that kind of a synergistic thing um, to excite people. Now the limits are, you know, how much people can absorb. But if it's well, I think the limit is how well prepared is it? You know, like mm -hmm. if it's, we want it to be well prepared. I mean, but at the same, same time, from we're still building from scratch. You know, totally. So I mean, so the my my main concern, and I, and I had a long conversation with Echo about this. Yeah. Um, I think she'll and I, Echo's Echo's actually like currently right now getting paid to teach maker skills. Yeah. Um, so she'll have a lot to say on curriculum design. That's like one of. That's one of her strengths. So, yeah. uh, but yeah. the the general feedback is that um, I think while it's it is totally possible to get people through this much material in that timeline, um, it's it's really unlikely that unless they have a really strong background in a lot of these things already, it's unlikely that they're going to retain enough to feel like once they're out of the classroom setting, they actually know it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's like. Uh, when you do, when you when you teach people in the in the format of like, okay, do step A, step then step B, then step C. I'm going to tell you what step B and C are until you've done them, and then we're just going to like move you through the steps. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's a great way for people to wind up with a thing at the end. So like, I made this thing, and then people will say, well, how did you make it? Be like, I have no idea. I was moving too fast. I didn't actually absorb that part. I was just following instructions. Mm -hmm. um, and and so. You know, if that's your goal, if your goal is for people to have this tool at the end of it and then want to come back to you and be like, all right, now what do I do with this tool? Um, then that's one way to do it. But if your goal is for people to feel really empowered and like, I understand how this works, that's a very different approach. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So what do we you do? Know, I've done, I've done some... What would you suggest? Um, so... I mean, for me, it's really a matter of taking what is the what's the desired goal and working backwards from that. Because, like I said, you could if your desired goal is for people to have one of these machines and just to be using it without really understanding how it works until they have to kind of go back in and fix it or you know look on the forums and work out some new way of modifying it and be kind of part of this like modding community. Um, and but until they do that, then really just you want them to have this tool in their hands and to be using it for the things. If that's your goal, then this format is fine. Um, you know, if the goal is like you know, the goal could be any number of things, um, and that's going to inform the way well, that the, the information needs to be presented. The goal is to, that people actually are able to design them too. So we start with a basic freak out thing, but we're going to do um, into this. We want to have the 
Universal Access or the 3D Printer Construction Set Workbench and FreeCAD. That's, mm -hmm. um, I didn't really say that in there, but we need, and we have a part of that workbench, so we, we have basically like you click on, uh, here you drag and drop, make a frame, make an axis. So far we have mm -hmm. the frame where you can customize it to any size and shape. Um, next thing is axis, so just length and orientation. But mm -hmm. so so it's reinforcing. There's there's FreeCAD reinforces it. You're gonna build it in real life, and it's all the same thing throughout. And we cover that in the morning sessions, which is how do you design this thing? So right. I don't know. I, I th um, the goal is that people can take. Okay, so you've got the universal axis. You can redesign configurations, like. Mm -hmm. We can even show, like, when people, when we do the final build, we can have a demo there where you have a different configuration of axes. Like, for example, the D3D Simple, which doesn't have three axes but has four, so you've got more of a standard on both Z sides supported mm -hmm. uh, axis kind of deal. So, I don't know. I mean, um, every single part should reinforce itself because you're, you're building off the the universal controller for for its Arduino aspect. Um, you redo the controller so you learn about Marlin and all that. Like you learn mm -hmm. how to actually program and do a little thing. Okay, here's how I program the screen to display something else. So you get a little bit of programming. You get different codes for di running different things like running the welder. That's a different code in Arduino. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you got the circuit that's doing different but related, different but related circuits, like the circuits I chose there were two simple power electronic circuits, um, just basically power stage and, and signal. Um, mm -hmm. Super simple for a resistive load even, because the welder is resistive. Um, but yeah. it should, should be simple. Um, but no, I mean, all that makes <laughs> sense. I think the, the thing that I'm getting at is like... Um, yeah, how do people you know, handle this, that? Well, so I mean, it really depends on on how you pick your your intended students. You know, if if the people that you want to bring into this, like, are you know, engineering undergrads or people who have you know background in some some aspect of this, and what you're teaching them is a different way to do the thing they already know, then I think that might be a really good fit for what you're trying to do. If your goal is to take people who are coming in essentially being like, I don't know any of this, but it sounds cool, then you're going to need a very different approach. Um, and I think likely what will need to happen is you need to be very intentional about who you reach out to, to be students. I don't know, I, mean, I know you've done this in the past, and I don't know how that worked out, but like, if you have, uh, like, if you can make connections to engineering programs and, so, and you know, and people who are actively interested in open source movement, but are, but are like, know how, you know, know how the basics of all this stuff already works in a closed in environment. Okay. Um, well, you know that's you're, you're gonna I think you're gonna get a lot more of what you want out of okay. their process. So that's feedback, and um, so basically it's like okay, this is, ain't gonna be for novices. I was aiming that, uh, yeah, uh, it would be anyone like with instructions part that you build step A through Z. Yes, you can get that, but if you're more, it it dep what you get out of it depends on how skilled you are. But but it is on one level. You build crazy stuff that works, but mm -hmm. okay, if you're not skilled enough, you might not be able to redesign it. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's an entirely different thing. And so, what I would suggest is, uh, you know, you kind of you have your you have your sorting hat. You have your people coming in, and you you know you're going to need to figure out sort of what bucket to put them in um, based on how much they understand this stuff already. For the people who who are coming in as, as novices, mm -hmm. uh, I think you can unpack a lot of this information into, and say, like, instead of saying, okay, you know, in four days we're going to build these five tools, you can say, okay, in four days we're going to build one of these tools, but we're going to really spend time talking about why each thing functions the way it does and how this is, can be relevant to the things and get people excited and inspired, but also give them a lot of hand-holding. Um, you know, that's... It's going to be very very different experience, you know, I mean, if you're, it's like, how about it, um, so essentially what you're talking about is like stepping into, you know, like, like a third year engineering seminar, which, you know, if you've got two years of engineering under your belt, is exciting. If you have zero years of engineering under your belt, it's terrifying. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the, the context is really critical. And I think there's a lot of value here for people coming from both sides of that equation. It just has to be separated out. So you've got, um, you know, a track for people who are already, or I guess I mean, you can even just kind of define it as like, this is like the full track. And uh, depending on where you're coming from, here you need it. You know, if you're for like, for engineers, we recommend starting at like course, you know, 301. Mm -hmm. For total beginners, start at 101. And, you know, after several courses, you'll be ready for 301, which the engineers will be joining would it, in progress. Would it be possible to do uh, the course which has three versions, which has, this is, but still, the set, you're going through the same material, but mm -hmm. you've got three curricula, one, well, or like two, one is the beginning and one is the advanced. Uh, you think that would mm -hmm. be doable and you can still do all this, but treat it in a different way? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it just has to do with the timing. Um, you know, the so mm -hmm. you know, so okay. So I'm looking at the slide two of the modules, mm -hmm. and um, for for a beginner, you know, any one of these modules, like the you know the universal access and so on, um, that could be a that, that one module could be a full, you know, four-day, all-day course, and then they would need several days to kind of absorb and, like, process that, and then they could do another one. So it's really, I think, it's just about how much space you allow for each thing to happen and how much time you allow for explaining what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so you could still have essentially the same version. It's just how compressed in time is it. Uh, or, you know, you could, have, you could have roughly the same curriculum, as what I mean. Um, you know, but, like, for example, the, you know, FreeCAD, mm -hmm. um, which I've never used. I, I mostly use Fusion and a little bit of SolidWorks. Um, you know, e even for someone who is fairly proficient at, you know, one form of CAD, if they're, it, you know, just, look, guess, just getting up to speed on how to function efficiently and, and quickly in a new CAD uh, program, can take an afternoon, and that's if they're used to it. Um, you know, giving. I, I think the the main thing that I worry about having having been a classroom instructor myself for people of varying skill sets and backgrounds is that if people feel like they are slower than than what the class is designed for, and that class can't be flexible for them, it just ramps up stress for them until they get you know, more and more stressed out that they're they're slowing the class down or they're not keeping up with it. And the more stressed they get, the harder a time they have understanding what's happening until they just, like, fail out completely. Mm -hmm. um, and leave feeling like they didn't learn anything and they're super, you know, didn't enjoy it, didn't learn anything, and, you know, won't speak highly at it later. Um, you know, so if you're running your class as, like, you know, this is a gauntlet, and if you make it through to the end, you're a badass, and if not, then, you know, oh, well, try again later. That's totally the way to do things, and that's how some people do it. If the goal is to try to bring everybody along and really include everybody, mm -hmm. you need to allow space for that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and so, I, you know, I think there's a lot that you can do that's fairly simple in terms of, you know, you, you can use um, Typeform, for example, is a, is a really good, you know, free or very cheap service you can use. So that's like create questionnaire forms. Uh, and so, you know, so what I would suggest is, um, you know, you and I are going to talk about this once this is a little further along, and when, when there's a, a more complete offering, I'm like this is what the course is going to look like, and I'll put it out through my my connections at Nation of Makers. And so most people who get who who put their hand up for Nation of Makers are going to have some background in some of this, but it's going to vary very it's going to vary wildly. Um, but if there's a questionnaire that you can send out that says, you know, okay, tell us a bit about you know what kind of stuff you worked on in the past, and like have just be able okay. to say like you know are you novice beginner intermediate advanced in you know microcontrollers cad cnc whatever um and then be able to essentially say like you know okay the we're going to recommend you take the you know the one two or four day version of this module based on your background um that's 
I realize that logistically that presents a lot of problems on the instructor's end because you end up having to space things out in a lot of ways and figuring out how that works will be an interesting challenge. But if the goal is to really get people um, from, from a variety of backgrounds to really absorb and integrate this and become part of a new community that can actually help you modify and, and, and extend this technology, you either have to just ignore novices at for to start. Like you just like you have to either ignore them completely and just go for the people who are already kind of advanced practitioners, or you have mm -hmm. to really slow down the process. Um, well, so okay, so what if what if this happens? What if, what if, would you see it happening that we have see one? Now? Still, I, I mean, I, I think there's beauty to the integration of the whole thing, but we run. Mm -hmm. Instead of one, two, or four modules, yeah, keep it all. But you're teaching, you have a completely different kind of a curriculum for the beginner, which, yes, you're right, we would lose them. And then mm -hmm. a different one for the advanced. But they got to get that whole level of, because they can, I mean, do you think that it would not be enjoyable if they built all this stuff still? I mean, and. Hmm. To me, it seems like so, hell yeah, it's going. I mean, my experience has been the the only way people don't enjoy stuff is when here, like with extreme builds, when people when people don't finish a build. Right. But as long as you build it and it works, I mean, that in itself is just profound for most oh, absolutely. people. So, so keep it at that. So, so you have the total beginning thing, and they they may not understand every, you know, at a mm -hmm. deeper level, but they will understand that whole process. Totally, and and that's and that's um, like having people who have just gone through the process and built it without necessarily understanding every step. Uh, if you can find the people who are who are down for that, I think that's great. I think it's really a matter of just being kind of clear with expectations and working working from what your desired goal is backwards. Um, and so I think the thing actually that you've said that I didn't I didn't pull out earlier, but I think is that what I understand as your maybe desired goal for this is so the way I see it is that, you know, you've been working on this on your compound in Missouri for like the last 10 years and you're kind of ready for the next stage where this actually seeds yeah. to other places in the world. And yeah. so, so really like you're looking for apostles, like you're, you're looking for the people who really understand what you're doing, who can understand it well enough to teach the next generation, of people in places that are not physically connected to you. So what I think what you know I would design this curriculum with an eye to finding the people who really get it, who already know how, who already know a lot of this stuff and who have already taught some of it. Um, and start with something that's going to be uh, a little more closed a lot more focused on not only like here's how you build all this stuff but here's how you teach other people how to build it here's all of the questions that you know everyone has in the process and everyone should know how to answer all of them uh, not just how to build it but how to walk someone else who doesn't know half as much as you do how to build it yeah um and if you can yeah. find those people and go through around with them then those are going to be the people who are capable of saying here's how i would modify this here's you know how I'm going to teach this variation of it, and here's, you know, I already have the connections to start doing this on my own. Um, so that's your goal, I think. Finding a small group of people who are already half experts is going to get you a lot further. And then the next round after that is going to be more open it up to a wider audience. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's my two cents. Uh, so tailor this to more advanced people. Okay, here's another element I want to introduce and then see what you think about that. So the mm -hmm. the ideal outcome is that we're teaching open source product development. Like so, you get basic skills in the four days, and you do some project, some tangible project in the last five days. So it's all building up mm -hmm. to open source product development of real products, and each camp building mm -hmm. upon the results of the former. So mm -hmm. whether you like it or not, you're you really are participating in open product development, at least, for, of course, the instructors are because they're contributing some of the content and we contribute yeah. improvements mm -hmm. all the time. Um, the idea was that the people that come out of that, they can set up, per, like, 
with the small tools, of course they have to work at it, but they can set up small production of say 3D printed goods, some very popular mm -hmm. items, whatever. So it was really for people who want to start producing in their community. So yes, get yourself a little micro factory, little 3D printer and start doing basic stuff. And of course develop that. But, but I wanted that to be like, Hey, this is so accessible to so many people already. Like if you have a 3D printer, then you mm -hmm. really need to know how to design and how to, uh, produce parts which i think in nine days we should be able to teach that and so people are actually getting into productive like real productive capacity um but is that are you considering that the idea that hey we're coming out of this and we're like for example if we have um, a curated set of production engineerings for 12 top products like say mm -hmm. a 3d printed pen a vice cordless drill later and all these other things later but it's like already you can go into business doing that so that that was like the big big deal it's like okay we've got all this curated stuff that hundreds and thousands of hours already gone into this of development time mm -hmm. we're building upon past work and we're starting off and getting into enterprise producing stuff i mean what what do you think of that kind of approach hmm. so so this is I really think about livelihood creation. I mean, this yeah, is like exactly. no, this creation of right, livelihood here. Yeah, hmm. yeah, which I which I love, and I think it's one of one of the things I really like about this whole project. Hmm. Um, so, uh, design thinking absolutely should be part of it. I I would. Yeah. That being said, I would I would still try to parse that out into a separate thing. I would say, you know, so say we're talking about like all right. Uh, first series is you're gonna you're gonna build these machines and you're gonna say okay we're we've got you know by the end of this you should know you should have the tools that you need for all of the the next in the series mm -hmm. that you've mm -hmm. made yourself yeah. Uh, yeah but but design thinking and being able to say okay here is a set of design criteria like you would get from a client you know here is a problem mm -hmm. I want you to solve it based on these constraints go and solve it and then yeah. actually like, prototype and produce at you know production quality a thing that solves that problem yeah that in and of itself is an entire process and some people will take to it very quickly and some people will have no idea where to start mm -hmm. so again you have to like if you want to fold this into everything you're gonna need to be mostly pulling from people who already know some of this mm -hmm. if you're trying to get people from zero to hero like unpack that into its own thing and and market it as a design thinking like an open source design thinking you know workshop uh, i think you'll get a lot of people uh, and there's some really good you know design you know some training programs in schools that you could partner with uh to so sort you're, of saying the one level, you're saying the level for the beginner is the open source design thinking so that's the one that unpacks everything so that's not the advanced version um, so I'm saying the one for beginners, yeah, is you like, like, so say if all of these are nine day immersions, just as the sort of basic time unit for the sake of argument, mm -hmm. um, instead of trying to cram, op instead of trying to cram design thinking into, you know, the last half of one nine day workshop where everything is happening all at once. Um, I think for, for some advanced people, that'll totally work, but those are going to be people who have already done some of this for people who don't have experience with design thinking and production at that at that level um they'll get a lot more out of it if you make it its own thing you know like say okay here's the skills on how to you know build these things now come back for the next session and we'll walk you through the process of how to apply those skills and machines in a you know like a client facing design process um mm -hmm. you know because i mean i think that the the, the thing that I worry about mm -hmm. with the way that you presented it mm -hmm. is um, there's a certain amount of like if you build it they will come attitude uh, that a lot of people end up with in these kind of training programs. I'm not saying that's what you're going to do but similar things exist with like here learn how to use a 3D printer and start a business well and they you know they kind of gloss over the fact that learning how to use a 3D printer you can do in a day and learning how to start a business can take years. And they sort of present them as like, oh yeah, no, go go start making stuff and find people to buy it, as though it's sort of that trivial. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a, honestly, what I would actually think would be more interesting, is so generally, the, 
um, how do I put it? The opportunities that make you know these kind of entrepreneurial projects interesting come from being able to make connections that are not immediately obvious to you or to the people around you. Uh, I, w I would imagine so. If we go back to you know this idea of your your first round of people are going to be advanced sort of inner circle people who are going to be the next the, the first round of teachers in like regional leads in other places they are likely going to be the people who create the seeds for the business network that mm -hmm. the students will then actually start up participating in and mapping that having having some map of that already and saying okay we've got people mm -hmm. in california we've got people in missouri we've got people in rio we've got people in moscow whatever um, who are all familiar with this ecosystem and are acting as nodes. And then you can start mapping mm -hmm. needs and uh, and sort of, you know, capable services and resources and so on around those nodes. And then what you start doing is mm -hmm. saying, bringing people in for these, you know, these business, the, like more business oriented classes. Mm -hmm. And you kind of show them at the map that you have. And you say, okay, here's where we have, here's the resources that we have to work with within our network. You know, what what is the opportunities that you see here? How would you go about solving this opportunity? You you have access to everyone in here. Uh, you have access to whatever you bring to the table and whatever you can go out and find. But this is the the substrate on which we're going to start building it. And you give someone you give them the structure that you've already established. And that's when you can start saying like, okay, you know, if these things are cheap to produce here and have high demand over there, if I can send my you know, if I can design something and send it to this guy to produce here and then manage the logistics of him getting it to this, these people over here, then that's a business. But for one person to just sort of create that from nothing and expect it to work is, I think, unrealistic. Well, but why do you say from nothing? The idea here is that we're building upon, uh, you know, years of prior knowledge or, say, years of prior product development or what's already available through open source. Right, but I mean, business is a lot more than just product. Like, you can have an amazing product, and if you right, if you can't produce product. it in the right place for the right amount and get it to the right people, it doesn't matter. Um, right. No, I agree with you on that. Um, let me add, add one more thing. Yeah, absolutely. Like, product, a business is not a product. A business mm -hmm. is like marketing and distribution and fulfillment and all that. Like, yeah, product is not yeah. it for a business. Right. But here's a twist on that I talk about this thing called distributed market substitution which is you've got products that you know already exist and we're saying we're gonna compete with them god damn it <laughs> we're gonna compete with like uh, whoever detergent here's plastic dog toys here's mm -hmm. like I don't know whatever uh, vacuum robots quarters drills but common items even plumbing fittings mm -hmm. potentially uh, that are yeah. are custom custom like ball valves, open source biodigesters, uh, whatever. Like your stuff that's like the different thing here is like I, I always and I'm trying to reconcile this. Like how does this work with what we're trying to do? Because always when when it comes to product development, someone all the time thinks about innovation. And mm -hmm. I'm saying we don't need innovation. Like you use toilet paper, mm -hmm. you use a mug, mm -hmm. and a pen, and a desk. Mm -hmm. We're going to do, go along the distributed market substitution route, meaning converting businesses, mm -hmm. converting industries to open source. So what that the innovation is not you're developing a new product. The innovation mm -hmm. is you're developing a new way to produce the same product. That's mm -hmm. the totally. ultimate goal. Like, okay, okay. we're going to figure so out I'm, how to do this cup in uh -huh. local production. We're not going to redesign a cup that's, you know... It's, it's like we already know people use stuff. You know, in this right. town here, we've got a thousand... Okay, my town, Maysville, a thousand people. They each spend $20,000. So there's a $20 million economy of products that I could be selling to this thousand-person town right now. Mm -hmm. I want to capture right. some of that. That's the kind of thinking I'm, I'm having. Okay, you know, that, that makes a lot of sense. sense. I get that. Mm -hmm. so, so does that... The same argument, like you were talking about, the business is not a product. Like, tell me, tell me, uh, with this new information here. Okay. Tell me that again. So, yeah, yeah, so that all makes a lot of sense. Um, 
so then I think the really then what you're talking about is like you you need people to understand um, supply chain. Like the reason why. So if you say, okay, what are the, you know what are the things that you you know or people around you spend money on that like where do those actually come from? Which most people don't know at all. Right. And saying, you know, this this one machine is made from components that come from eighteen different factories from twenty different cities from four different countries and you know across the ocean three times. Right. Because because you know somehow for these reasons that's still cheaper than just making one here. So if we can figure out how to make it here in a way that you know uh, might have a higher unit cost, but you can say you know the carbon footprint of making this clothes dryer here is effectively zero compared to the one that you spend you know a hundred dollars less for from China. But the you know here's the actual carbon footprint. I think being able to talk about it in that way is going to be huge. Um, also being able to say you know, this is how much of the cost of, that you're paying for this stays in the local economy versus going to exactly. these things like that. Being able to map it and present it that way, I think, will be incredibly compelling. Yeah, and then, and, uh, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you because you're saying it, but, I mean, what you're saying right now is that's the circular economy concept, but also it's just the plain de-retardation of the economic system from saying we're oh, externalizing all the costs to saying hey we're actually going to internalize the fact that we're cutting down forests and ripping up the environment and killing people with this and we're just right. complying with wall street because that's how they the the inefficient global systems have been created they're not lower costs they're just externalized cost kind of deal yeah, right? exactly. so we can get into that and that's that's the kind of stuff i want to be pushing that that is transformative in people's agree, consciousness. No, I, I completely agree. I think that's, yeah. that's, that's where it's really exciting. Um, so, so yeah, and, and again, I think that's the kind of stuff where the way that I would teach that information depends entirely on what I want the students to be doing by the end of it. If I just want them to have a general understanding of, you know, global supply chain and sort of why you know, like externalized costs and sort of where there's room for them to innovate. Um, that's something that, you know, you could easily spend two full days on just talking about that. And people would feel like they kind of had like started to grasp some of the complexity enough to start interacting with it. If the goal is really just to say, identify a thing and figure out how to make it and kind of use this, this template that we've going to give that we've given you to, work out true cost versus externalized cost, then you can do it fairly quickly. You know, again, it just like, but the, the problem with that is that if people don't, haven't truly understood the, the context around supply chain and, and carbon footprint and so on. Uh, if they haven't truly understood that, they're not going to be able to communicate it to the next group of people out. You know, so if you want someone to say, I've made this thing and it's more expensive than the one that you buy from Target, but here's why that's a good thing. Um, they need to really understand that. And so, you know, again, this is where I feel like your your first ring of people need to uh, probably go through some deeper training and extend that over some period of time uh, so that they're, they're really able to communicate all of the ideas outward without, you know, you... Cause like, uh, the thing that I would be worried about is, because I've seen this happen all the time, um, is you're like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to explain an advanced concept to you. And then a month later, I hear you explaining the concept to someone else. And I'm like, that's completely wrong. And now I'm embarrassed that my name's attached to it. Uh, and you have to kind of go do damage control. So like making sure that that's understood before it's communicated out. Uh, you're going to need to, you're going to need to fact, either find people who are already relatively advanced in it or give them extra time. Well, um, I think that we got to script it out tightly. I mean, everyone's going to produce the curriculum and it's going to be like, yeah, we teach our instructors, and but since this is so much knowledge in nine days, we can only do a survey. But I was hoping for the survey. Like the ideal outcome to me is a person comes to this course, uh, mm -hmm. a novice, and by the end of it, they're gonna be able to design a 3D printed brush. <laughs> like this, a common thing where you can actually print the, there's ways you can actually print brushes with the fine hairs 
by going rapidly like an air and stuff like that. So huh. um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's on the wiki. 3D printed brush. Like it's crazy <laughs> the kind of stuff you can do. Uh, so um, that's what I want people to come out of it. It's like okay, this is a stupid product, a brush. It's like okay, that's not exciting. That doesn't get Google excited, or <laughs> that, that right. doesn't get uh, Silicon Valley excited. But it's the most exciting thing because you can be doing it right now. And it could be for mm -hmm. a real part of your real economy because people buy brushes, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, what do you think? I mean, can we get this? I mean, ideally, I'm thinking of this survey that just because you have done it, your world is transformed. And also, how do you apply augmented reality learning into this? Interestingly, the so there's a guy from Nigeria that's joined in the team, and he's into mm -hmm. AR, and it's like holy cow. Uh, maybe we can talk about augmented reality instructionals, how you, you learn to build these things faster so you can learn ever more quickly uh, how to do this. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Um, but, okay, but the point so remains, yes, okay, we, we're going to have to be very clear about the target audience and making sure that it's structural. Mm -hmm. But I think um, I, this is going to come out in a wash because this is like initial but once we have all the curriculum we all sit down and we say okay this is what we can teach and then we can decide okay how exactly do we teach it um like there's time in this process to i think address this and you're bringing mm -hmm. this out pretty early like that um yeah i just sent you a link by the way to um an autodesk uh ar cad project Um, which might be, you know, I know you're trying to, to work as much with open source as possible, but for, for certain applications, at least until that software exists open source, it might be worth trying to see about getting, for example, like, you know, a donation from Autodesk of, you know, some fusion licenses with the AR, you know, supplement to kind of play with for this um, as a, as a experiment. Uh, But yeah, I think coming back to our topic of conversation, um, you know, there's so there's the build the tools and then there's the apply the tools kind of conversation. There's the there's you know we're talking about design thinking, we're talking about supply chain disruption, uh, entrepreneurship, a lot of pieces. I think you can, you can definitely touch on all those topics in the nine-day course. And what it what it might end up being, to be honest, is that you, you know, you do a, you do this nine-day survey with you know I don't know forty people or whatever whatever your you know numbers you're going for, um, but you set up some really good systems afterwards to capture feedback, and and do it in a data-driven way so you can kind of collate it and map it and get a get a sense of where the patterns actually are. And say, you know, okay, we talked about a lot of things very quickly. What are the things that you're most interested in having more classes on? What are the things that you, you know, didn't get as much out of? And you might, it might just be like, you know, the first round is just market research, because we can make assumptions all day long about how we think it's going to go and how we assume, based on our past experiences, things will people will respond. Uh, but to some extent, people are just going to self-select in based on their interest and skill level. And they're going to tell you what they want more of. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, we designing this for you know a, a hypothetical audience is only going to take us so far. Um, you know, if you're if you're it sounds like you're really wanting people to be able to kind of go from this as quickly as possible into you know producing and fabricating their own things, um, but there's going to need to be something in place before someone just starts, you know, 3D printing stuff and sort of selling it to their neighbors. Uh, like, the, you, need to, yeah. you need to get a little bit past that. And, and teaching people how to identify actual needs and how to, you know, manage sort of like the basics of business, how to, how to share those resources. 
So what I would maybe do in that case, and again, this was like this was like a uh, you know an, an additional module that maybe some people um, some people sign up for and some people don't, but saying like, okay, this is how you know th this is how co-ops work. This is how you say okay, we know like the the eight of us all want to start businesses doing different things, but we all need HR and accounting and you know these services. This is how we can pool resources and share those. You know, that's not necessarily core to what you're teaching, but it's core to the values of how you operate and teaching people. And it's also something that a lot of people don't. You know, it, it's not the common way of doing things in the states, and so teaching people how to set up a co-op. You know, based on fabrication and prototyping, or or you know, small scale manufacturing, um, feels like it'll absolutely be useful for some people, and will help help prevent this from just turning into being like co-opted by capitalism as usual. You know, but then again, it's, but it's also not something that you're going to get by you know spending half an hour talking about it on day eight when people are already kind of brain fried. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the experience that we have from uh, dozens of Extreme Build workshops is that mm -hmm. what we found is that the audience likes to be exposed to just a ton of crazy stuff. And if, even if people are not skilled, they do little tasks mm -hmm. that contribute to a bigger picture. And that's been, mm -hmm. uh, their feedback on that has been very, that's been very rewarding for everybody. It's like, I mean, the feedback on that is very positive. Like even people who are absolute beginners Mm -hmm. And they're doing stuff, and, and they're doing it at their skill level. Uh, so I think just this idea of immersion training, like dive into the deep end thing, from our experience, that's, that's a value, a significant value of people just going out of their comfort zone and trying new things. Mm -hmm. That's one of the uh, big attractions for the people that at least came here when we position it as like a crazy learning ex immersion learning experience where you do a lot of different things yeah um, that we cool. found works and it's got a good audience I mean uh, yes. yeah so I mean I, I don't really believe that I guess my question is um, what does follow-up look like like what how does it how does it work when people you know have done one of those and then there's kind of like the okay now what You know, how, how many people are, are going from that and starting starting on their own or coming back from more advanced workshops versus just saying, I did a thing, and then kind of going back to their lives? Like, that's the part well, that I would, I would be curious yeah. about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, the part, the fraction that does something is, of course, very minor. Most people uh, take it as edutainment, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But some people do. So some people end up, okay, they end up designing something, building something. And that person is one one in a couple of dozen probably um, right. one out of a one out of maybe 24 or something um, mm -hmm. not not a lot and now especially if we're now those those are typically for like extreme like for example the one guy who came to a brick build is now catting up and uh, the next version of the brick press that he wants to build um, mm -hmm. because he had the experience like he's confident enough that oh yeah I could build this thing um, but that's without him taking the, any products home. That was just the training. But now here, the idea is that you are get, getting some, taking some products home. That it's it's all about your motivation. It depends on who comes to this. Ho hopefully, we're reaching out to people who are entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right. I mean, the, there there are significant limits to to the entrepreneurial population. There's like. An, I mean, I guess the number I hear is maybe like 5% of the population. And right. not only that, I mean, all those people are in Silicon Valley and they're not interested in this mundane uh, printing mm -hmm. a toothbrush. Um, so there is a limited audience, but I think that's the audience we got. The, the guys who are the makers, the, the builders of, who like building things. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I mean, and, and also in some way the market doesn't exist. We're creating it, man. Like, right, exactly. we're, we're creating more, more of these people by making it cool. Like, but that's why I think it's, it's critical that we do include that survey part. But not only the survey part, 
but the fact that you're actually building out well-defined, well-refined products, like say the, the five-day product at the end, I mean, that's going to be well-developed. Someone's going to have to prepare that pretty well right. and so forth. So, um, yeah, the, the, we're just trying to increase that population of people that can do this work. And mm -hmm. I think... No, I get that. I, I think, think the, 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 the one thing that I think is really critical yeah. in terms of building that population is as you build that population of people who can do this and can think about this in this new way, is you have to really intentionally build the connections between them at the same time. Mm -hmm. like it, it won't be enough to just have them all kind of working alongside each other in this, you know, two-week intensive and then going their separate ways. Um, like, there needs to be something in the curriculum and in the, the structure that supports the curriculum that keeps people connected and keeps people aware of what each other is doing and of, you know, when people are have a new idea and have to figure out what they need in order to make that idea happen so that they, the first people they think to, to talk to are the other ones from their cohort. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and you know, and find the people out of that that cohort who are able to able and interested to take it a step further and to get more advanced and to kind of give them a sense of like this is the full, you know, like this is this is the full you know sort of like master's degree program from OSC. You just take in course one. Like this is this is how far you can take it, and you can kind of mix and match and pick from within this. But there's a there's an arc to it, and the goal is to get you here, um, and to give people that sense of what's possible relative to what they've done. And how that they how they can be supported in working with each other on that. Like that's a lot of you know that's a lot of what things like MIT Media Lab really did well. You know for all for all of their failures, um, you know some of the programs like that that where you know people who were part of that program with each other you know 15 years ago went on to be you know like start Fortune 500 companies because they had each other's support. And how did that Media Lab do it? I have some friends who were actually went there who could describe it much better than me. I've I've heard it described, but I'm not not well enough that I can say this is how they did it. But in general terms, it was this way of not just like so again, you know, you were saying earlier, um, people are used to doing this competitively. Like if some of the people sitting to your left and right are competing with you for the same grade, maybe the same job. But if you make it collaborative, you say, okay, all of you are trying to get through this together. No no one of you individually will be capable of getting through this on your own. So you all have to come together on how to solve this and learn to rely on each other and learn to put all of your resources on the table because you don't know what someone else is going to think of to do with it. And get people in the habit of doing that uh, so that the, the approach to problem solving itself is open source. Uh, that, I think, is going to be really critical. Yeah. And then, by the way, the this feeds into incentive challenges. People who take this, they're going to be able to know how to CAD and design things, especially if they build the electric motor, battery packs. It's all mm -hmm. like it goes into the drill. Yeah, exactly. There's that. The other part is participating in other extreme builds. So we want to organize extreme builds around the incentive challenge too. So meetings, mm -hmm. physical meetings, and also there's a meetup like. If people get this, so basically the machines in this constitute a dev kit. It's a bunch mm -hmm. of basic tools that you can develop with. So meetups with dev kit, you know? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah, meet, meetups, hackathons, all that kind of stuff will be great. Um, that's, you know, but again, I think like that's a, that's a really awesome and important sort of phase two. But, but to get there, you need to be able to get that inner circle of people who are really experts in the, the process and who can kind of lead the, you know, lead it for other people. Um, like you, you need your first, you need your first community of experts uh, before you have a community of enthusiastic novices. Otherwise you're going to get that, you know, one in 25 maybe does anything else with it. Um, uh, so and I just think your, you know, your return on, on, that, on that effort is going to be really low until you can get your team of experts enthusiastic about it. Sorry, what were you saying? Well, it seems that the instructors are going to be the community of experts, right? Exactly. Um, and it sounds like looking on your um, thing here, so like Michelle and Bosco and 
Chris Caswell and Emmanuel and Therdy are kind of your uh, initial yep. pool of instructors. Mm-hmm. Um, it was awesome. So I guess, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to, trying to like mentally model what I know about your situation. I know, or like, I don't know very much, so please take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. Uh, it's not relevant, but um, yeah, I think we can get, you know, you got, it sounds like an, an early pool of instructors. Uh, but yeah, but where's be... your name in there? <laughs> Let's see. Let me look. Let me see. I'm looking through to see like what would make sense for me to actually work on. Are you uh, doing anything related that you can piggyback on? That's like pretty close. Uh, let me see. I mean, part of it is I need to see a lot of these unpacked. Yeah, to, yeah. To that's that's the best what they actually are. Right. I, uh, I gotta get right into that and. Yep, so I think maybe yeah. I'll ask you that later. Yeah, but... Um, yeah, I'm definitely interested in kind of finding more in here that I can be like, oh yeah, no, I can totally do that. Um, yeah, because I'm, I'm certain there's something in here that I can help with. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is yet. But... Um, let's see, it's getting about lunch time here and yeah. I haven't anything today so I should probably yeah, yeah. wrap this up but um, I, hope that, I hope this has been helpful for you um, I'm, I always enjoy talking to you I definitely want to get Echo on a call with us soon um, yep. I think, I think mm-hmm. you connected with Echo will be super valuable and she's yeah. going to have a lot to say about this as well I emailed her to set up a time yeah, um, yeah. that's good well, yeah, so that's good. Thank you. So what I'll do is uh, I'm going to continue and come up with this budget and um, pass it on to you and see if uh, by the end of this week we'll know about the budget too, I think. So Great. we'll see what we can do. Okay, awesome. Uh, and at this time, like, do you have time to, like, say we found money, do you have time right now to contribute stuff? Or like, how much time do you have? Um, let's see. So right now I have... I have, I have a handful of, of projects in, in motion right now, so not a ton of time. But if, if we can say, like, okay, there's going to be budget, and then, you know, I can carve out time, you know, starting in a month or two, and then I know that I'm going to be planning on doing this. Um... Yeah, I mean, it depends on the time commitment. I, I definitely, this is important, and I definitely want to figure out how to make space for it. I'm just trying to figure out where that goes in an otherwise full system. Um, when you're talking about getting involved, can you give me a better sense of what you, what that looks like to you? Well, if um, if there's a task on a in terms of the technology or curriculum development, that means to develop that, mm-hmm. produce that curriculum and documentation and a prototype. Mm-hmm. That's what that means. Does that answer the question? Or? Um, broadly, I mean, I guess I have to I have to look at it more closely and see, and get a better, to get a better sense of like what you know, like how many man hours is that actually? What is what is the actual process look like? Um, uh, you know, outside of this document here, um, do you have? Do you have an example of a document that's like, this is a full curriculum for, you know, this other thing that I've taught, and this is kind of the level of resolution and fidelity that it needs to have to be considered complete? That's that's part of what I'm unclear on. Because, um, like, I've taught stuff where all I had was a handful of index cards to kind of remind me what to say next, and I got through, you know, a several-hour course that I taught just fine, yeah. and people seem to get it. Um, no, it literally, but, it literally, I think, hmm. would have to be a transcript because... So that means whatever you're going to say in that one hour has to be on mm-hmm. paper simply because we're teaching each other, right? So we're, right. yeah, that's, it has to be that. Unless okay. you're making the assumption that we've got fast internet and mm-hmm. one person, just one person does it instead of many people presenting that. So people listen through the internet for one person who's a specialist on that doing that. Mm-hmm. But 
I don't know, that, that to me says that our teachers don't know the stuff enough if we have to rely on other people. So I think each of right. us needs to know that. Uh, so th in other words, exactly. a full script from each person would be required. So, I mean, I so think that means rather than this. Well, so if the, goal is, if the goal is for the teachers to teach the teachers until we all know everything. Yeah. Um, so that we can all teach the whole course. Mm -hmm. uh, then I think the it's it's going to need to be more than just a script. It's like a, a script doesn't tell me how to teach things; it just tells me what to say. Um, script in addition to the additional documents, such as you've got the items listed on page five, right? So you're going to have to have the grad. Right. There's a prototype. Maybe there's software. The script mm -hmm. would be what you're saying during class, but right, and then there might be other. Right. That would yeah, exactly. That so that would be script as well as you know materials and course materials. materials. That's, yeah. So I get that, and that's that's pretty involved. It's definitely doable. Yeah, it I've, I've taught classes, you know, for several years, so I, I know what what kind of needs to happen. I think that's also a really important framing to remember is that this is this part of the curriculum development is teaching other experts who just maybe not are not experts on this one thing, but these are all people who the other teachers. Yep. Um, is there a, is there a place where we all can kind of get together physically and teach each other, or does this all have to be done remotely because we're all really scattered? We're scattered right now. Yeah. And hmm. the idea for the kits is that um, ship the kits to me if you got it. Like, say, Michelle sends me the motor, and I replicate mm -hmm. it here. I want to make right. sure that I can replicate it according to his instructions. Yes, yep. that's going to have to require that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. That's a challenge. I mean, it's doable, but it's going to take, you know, idea with digital fabrication tools that it'll be straightforward. And um, the challenge is to design it in such a way that it lends itself to simplicity. That's the part that I think most people have a difficulty with. It's not easy right. to design things to be simple. It's easy yeah, to make exactly. a bullshit design that's just too complicated. That's very common. Right. <laughs> but elegance yeah. is not not common. Completely agree. Um, so yeah, there is, I mean, yeah, so there is significant demands, but you know that's why we're trying to break this up and get a budget. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, where I'm at right now is um, I need to be really focused on what makes me money because I've been doing the things that don't make me money for too long, and I'm I'm not in a great position because of it. Um, Part of what that means, though, is that I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I'm working my way into a couple, course, like a couple uh, lines of work that pay extremely well and that have flexible hours. So as I get kind of more stable in that, and I'm like, okay, I can make, I can make all my bills by working, you know, this 30 hours a month, and that gives me some time where I can do stuff for, for free or for less money and still feel okay about it. Um, so I'll, I will hopefully know in like about a month uh, where that's going to look like and, and what kind of time I can carve out. Uh, but I can't make a guarantee right now that I can yeah. uh, put the time it would take to do this right. And the last thing I want to do is promise that I can do it when I can't actually deliver. Yeah. So I want to get to a place where I can make that promise, but mm -hmm. I'm not there right now. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and I, I understand how frustrating that is. Uh, having been in your position, trying to find people to help. Uh, so I want to. I just. I'm just trying to be clear about what I can no, deliver no, that's on. Fine. That's fine. Uh, so we want to do a, like a kickoff, not a kickoff, but a, somewhat of a kickoff meeting this this Friday. Do you want to join us? Mm -hmm. We're going to basically meet with all the people in red on in this on page two. Um, yeah. To yeah, check and um, let's try to get Echo to join us for that. Um, yeah, yeah let's, let's do that, and then so, uh, so to my echo, uh, I would love to do that. Uh, so I think I think once I've met some of the other people and I have a better sense of where the state of play is, it'll be easier for me to figure out what I can commit to. Right. Um, uh, so yeah, please please send me an invitation. Um, okay. I will be I'll be working from home on Friday. So okay. My time should be possible. Okay. Sounds great. Sounds great. Well, thank you for talking. That's that's good. Um, Hope we can collaborate in the future. This is good. And yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. awesome. Play Thank Excellent. Thanks, Nathan. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.